Good morning. Um, welcome back. Uh, we, uh, after uh, taking a look at uh, two lectures uh, uh, related to uh, class and objects, uh, today we want uh, to uh, address uh, one of uh, the most used uh, predefined classes in many programming languages. Uh, in Python it's called lists, in uh, Java it's called arrays. Thus, uh, let me uh, start uh, to give you an idea about, uh, uh, let's say, what we did so far regarding predefined data types. We took a look at uh, uh, two different types of uh, data types. One, we call it uh, primitive data types. If I write int x is equal to 5, okay, then x will be a variable. Okay, the variable will hold uh, a value of type uh, integer. Since I'm using int, it means actually in the memory, 32 bits will be reserved uh, to store uh, the value of x. Uh, 5 is a positive number, okay, and that's why uh, the 5 is an integer. It's actually compatible to the data type of x, and that's why once uh, we uh, compile, okay, uh, this one will work actually perfectly, and uh, we will be having actually in the memory a variable which is called x and having a value uh, 5. Okay, uh, we uh, took a look uh, at uh, uh, the following primitive data types, uh, integers, uh, floating point numbers, uh, Boolean uh, data type, uh, and last but not least, characters. Okay, and then we uh, looked at uh, strings. Okay, string is not a, a primitive data type. That means if I'm having a string S, okay, thus we can actually write it as follows without, let's say, defining anything, okay, else except actually to put the text uh, uh, between uh, brackets. Okay, now just actually keep in mind that actually a string is uh, a class. Okay, a string is an object. There is a string class. Okay, and in the string class, uh, there are actually some of the attributes. Uh, one of them is the content of the text that I want actually to write. And last but not least, there are a few, uh, let's say, uh, constructors. Okay, at least one. And a few methods that you can actually use to uh, manipulate uh, object of type strings. Meaning in this case, since we, we dealt with... Uh, uh, object. The question is, if a string is an object, then uh, there should be actually one constructor uh, which will be having one parameter which corresponds actually to uh, the string itself. Now, what I will do is, if I write system dot out dot print line, and I will be printing in this case, uh, uh, let's say s, then what will happen? Uh, Java uh, will go and see that I'm calling now, I'm uh, initializing uh, a value or s, a variable, with uh, an object of uh, type string. And once I will print it, then in this case, the CSEN will be printed. Meaning in this case, I know exactly that there is one method in uh, the string class, which is a two string method, because once I will, uh, uh, let's say, uh, print uh, the s, I don't get the reference, but I get the content of the string itself. Okay, now uh, let's play a little bit around. Let's assume I'm having a second string S2, which is having a new string. Okay, in this case, okay, CSN. Yeah. And now since I am having actually two objects, I want actually to check whether S is equal to S2. Okay, now uh, keeping in mind that the whole thing actually will hold for a string because a string, as I said before, it's a class actually where I can uh, construct uh, uh, object of type string. And now S will have a reference, S2 will have a totally different reference. And that's why if I will compare S with S2 using the equal equal symbol, I will get actually false because they are having actually different references. Okay, now the question is, what will be actually the same? This, the content of the two strings is the same. Okay, thus there are actually a few methods predefined in the class itself, okay, which is the string class. One of them is called equals. Okay, equals is uh, a method uh, predefined in the string class, and this one doesn't actually compare uh, the references of S and S2, but they compare, in this case, the content of uh, S and S2. And the content of S and S2, okay, in this case, is identical, and that's why I'm getting actually true in this case. Okay, 
Now, uh, let's go back. Now, what I want actually to do is, I want uh, to uh, look at um, now the primitive data type uh, X. Okay, if I write something like that, then in computer science we call this variable a scalar variable. It's a variable that can take only one value at a time. For sure, I can, I can change it. I can actually go and change the x to be equal to 33. Okay, however, the value of x, okay, is always a single value at a time. That means at the end of the day, the 5 will be overridden and the 33 will be actually the latest value uh, of uh, x. Okay, now uh, the question is, um, what if I want actually to deal with uh, a kind of uh, collection of data? Okay, with scalar variables, I will be having a problem because a, val a variable will have only one value at a time. Thus, what I want actually to do is, I want to store, uh, let's say, a collection of data. Okay, uh, assume that I'm having the GPAs of all students and I would love to calculate the average uh, uh, GPAs of all students. Thus, in this case, I need uh, a kind of uh, a data type, okay, where uh, I can uh, store a collection of data. Okay, as I told you before, uh, we did that in uh, Python, okay, where uh, arrays uh, were called uh, lists. Uh, they uh, did actually resemble to uh, strings. However, in Java, the way how uh, you will be uh, working with uh, strings is totally different than actually the way how you would be working with arrays. Now, uh, let me start actually to change, let's say, the data type of x. Now, if I add two square brackets, okay, int square bracket x, then the x won't be a kind of scalar variable at all but in this case i want actually to store in x a collection of data this is an array the array is an array of integers and now what i can do is i can store in this case let's say three six seven and one okay once we have that okay what i can do is i can print uh, the x okay now, uh, you will see exactly what will happen. If I have int square bracket x, Java will know exactly that x is an array. x is an object, okay, and what I get here is, okay, I get the reference. Why? Because there is no toString method implemented in the array class, okay? That's what I'm getting here is, I'm getting something of the following form, okay? Square bracket i, it means it's an array of integers, add, and then actually the memory address where the array of uh, integers will be stored. Now the question is, um, let's take a look at uh, uh, some of, uh, uh, let's say, the predefined either attributes or methods implemented in the class array. Okay, now let me start actually to think about the length of uh, an array. Then I will be writing x dot length okay uh, keeping in mind that i'm thinking that there is a method called length okay in the uh, array class however once i will do it the java will tell me i'm sorry i have never actually seen a method called length in the class array and that's why what i will do is i will go and remove uh, let's say the two uh, uh, parentheses the two brackets and once i will compile compile java will tell me okay uh, I, I get it Okay, uh, there is something that gets me actually the length of x. Now the question is, this uh, 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 identifier is what? It's for sure not a method, because if it would have been a method, I would have, I had, I have to use, let's say, the brackets in this case. Okay, now this is actually the length of x. Thus, I know exactly now that the length is an attribute. Okay meaning it's an instance variable that is defined in the class array. And then I think is once you will compile and you will run it, what you will get here is you will get actually four, which corresponds to the total number of elements I'm having in my array. Okay, now uh, let's actually dig a little bit into the length. Now, since actually it's a variable, what I can do is I can increment actually the length by one. Okay, uh, now look at what will happen. Once I will do it, Java will tell me um, I'm having a problem. Okay, the variable, okay that is defined in the class array to be an instance variable is a final one 
okay a final variable in java is a constant that you cannot change its value okay thus here once you deal with arrays you are dealing with a static data structure it means whenever you fix the size you will not be able to either increase the size nor decrease it okay and that's why the size is fixed okay and here again if you are asking about the length of the array then in this case you will be getting four if you add let's say another element minus 11 now if you will do it then actually the uh, length of the array will become five and this is exactly let's say what i'm getting which is the total number of elements in this case okay now let's uh, uh, move on now i'm not having uh, now uh, a possibility to uh, uh, get let's say a display of all values but the question is what if i want actually to get the first value of the array okay thus arrays are zero based index data structure and that's why the first uh, element is in position zero okay that's if i will just compile this one and run it i'm expecting four as a result and what we get here is we get actually four okay and if you go here and you write two then you are actually getting the third element of the array in this case i should get seven okay now if i want to get the last element of the array i know exactly that the last element of the array is in position x dot length minus one okay there's x dot length minus one in this case will be five minus one five minus one will be four and four should give me 11 in this case you compile you run and what you will be getting here as a result is minus 11. nice you have to take care if you do actually something of the following for x okay of x dot length x dot length is out of bound and that's why once i will compile java will not complain however once i want actually to run it what you will be getting here is you will be getting the problem the problem is that i'm out of bound here an exception will be thrown and the exception is an array index out of bound okay because position 5 does not exist in the array at all okay the same thing and this is where you have to take care if you go to python and you write let's say some of the negative indices then actually it works but it works actually backwards however here if you will do it okay java will be having a problem it tells you i'm sorry if i see minus one okay as an index okay i will tell you the following that this index doesn't exist meaning all indices of arrays are always between zero and the length minus one of the array itself okay now let's go back and let's uh, imp, uh, print actually the x we saw it already once i will compile you do not get actually all elements but what you will be getting here is you will be getting just actually the reference it tells me that x is of type integer now if i would have actually changed it if i will change this one into let's say a double okay and you compile and you run it okay java will tell you i don't have any problem because actually the four will be converted to 4.0 okay the six will be converted to 6.0 and so on okay however here what i will be getting is is square bracket okay d d corresponds that that the element that i will be storing into the array itself is uh, uh, r of uh, type uh, uh, floating point you have to take care the data type is a homogeneous one meaning if i will go here and i want actually to store for 6.1 okay at compile time java will tell you i'm having a problem okay because i'm seeing four four i don't have any problem but here i'm seeing 6.1 6.1 should be an integer however here uh, i will be uh, having a problem because in this case i will be having a possible loss of uh, uh, precision uh, whenever i will convert 6.1 to an integer then actually the result will be six thus there is a loss of precision in this case okay now uh, it's nice it's good now what i want actually to do is i want uh, to have uh, let's say something that will print for me all elements of the array that's what i will do is uh, i will go and implement a method okay the method is a void one and what it does is it takes actually it's called display and it takes as a parameter an array of integers okay that's here I will go and uh, implement it what I have to do is I have to traverse the array uh, one by one that means I will go start with i equal to zero okay I will stop whenever I reach a dot length 
If not, then I will go and proceed, let's say, to go to the next cell. But every time I'm in a cell which is not out of bound, what I will do is I will take it and print it. It's, a, in this case, a counter loop. Okay, and most of the algorithms that we will be implementing will be counter loops. Okay, and the counter loop will go always from, let's say, position zero till the last element, which is a, in position a dot length minus one. And what it does is it performs an operation in this case. Okay, thus, what I will do is I will go and instead of using the system.out.print line, okay, the method is the static method. I will be just calling the uh, x, uh, the display method uh, on x. Uh, you will compile. This one will compile correctly. Once you will run it, then what you will be getting here is you will be getting the content of the array. Okay, the elements one by one, four, six, seven, one, and minus element. Okay, now uh, the question is what if I am having an array but I don't have um, its uh, uh, the, the elements uh, yet? Okay, but I know exactly that the array should be an array of a specific size. Now look what I will do. I will create an array with a specific size. The array is an object and that's why I will be always using the new keyword just to be able to create an array, okay, of type integer. Okay, now what I will do is the constructor, okay, there is a shorthand of it, is int square bracket where actually between the brackets I have actually to write the size of the array. Thus, in this case, once I will have it, okay, the meaning of this one is that x is an array and the length of the array is 10. Now, once you will compile actually and you will run, what you will be getting as a result here is zeros, okay, 10 zeros. Why 10 zeros? Because actually the array is an array of integers okay and what will happen in this case you will be getting let's say uh, you will be getting uh, uh, zeros as a uh, zero as a, as a default for integer in this case now if i will go and replace this one by double okay new double then in this case what i have to do is the method will have a problem once i will compile java will tell you i'm sorry I don't have a method display that is actually uh, having as a parameter an array of doubles. But what I'm having here is, is an array of integers. Okay, I can go, just change this one into double. Now, once I will compile, everything actually will be better. And last but not least, once I will run, I won't actually get to zero, but I will be getting 0.0, .0 in this case. Okay, uh, the same, I can have uh, an array of strings. Okay, that's what I will do is, I will go, and what I will do is, I will write new string. Okay, for sure, the data type of the array should change actually into a string. Now I'm having an array of objects, and the object that I will be storing in every set will be of type string. Now, since a string is an object, the default value of it will be null. And that's why once I will compile, this one will compile correctly. However, once I will run, what I will be getting here is, I will be getting null values. And the total number of null values will be 10, which corresponds actually to the size of this one. Now I will do it with three, in order to see that actually what will be printed here are three nulls. I will be just going from one cell to another. And in every cell, since the array is an array of objects, is an array of strings, the default value of an object is null, and that's why you are getting null as a value in this case. Okay, uh, now nice. I will go int x, okay, new int, and last but not least, I will change this one into an integer. And the question is, uh, is it possible to take uh, x of 0 and feed it with the value 22? Okay, x of 1 is equal to 33. Now, uh, once you will compile, Java will tell you, okay, I, I really don't have any problem. What you are actually having here is, is an array, and the array is an array of size 3. Automatically, the default value for every cell will be 0. And then what I am doing here is, I am just feeding, I am uh, 
uh, trying actually to override the values of the cells. Okay, in cell zero, I will be putting 22, and in cell one, I will be putting 33 in this case. Now, once I will compile, the result will be 22, 33, and last but not least, zero, because actually the last value hasn't been, in this case, uh, changed, and that's why you get actually the default value of uh, uh, the cell, which is actually in position two in this case. Okay, hope uh, it's uh, clear, hope uh, uh, we know now, let's say, uh, how arrays will look like. The array is an object, okay, and what I can do is I can go and manipulate, uh, let's say, the values of the cells. Okay, and again, if I will be having another array Y and the other array will be, let's say, something that is having actually three. And what I want actually to do is I want to check whether the two arrays are identical, yes or no. Okay, uh, what you will get here is as we saw it in uh, strings, uh, you will get uh, uh, false. Uh, because actually the two arrays are two objects, they are having actually different uh, references, and the references are not actually the same in this case. Okay, nice. Uh, let's uh, move on, and uh, let's actually manipulate uh, the whole thing. I will be having int y equal to x, okay, and what I will do is I take actually y of 0 and have 22 as a value in this case and what I want actually to do at the end of the day I want actually to uh, uh, display in this case the x okay now once I will compile and run uh, what you will be getting here is you will be getting actually two values two, uh, both of them are referring actually to the same uh, uh, place in the memory I am changing actually, let's say, the content of uh, this memory using the y. The x actually will see it because actually both of them are having actually the same reference in this case. Okay, thus again, exactly what we did in uh, the two previous uh, lectures about class and objects. Thus, arrays. Okay, uh, once you want actually to deal with them, you have to know that an array is an object. Okay, it's a predefined one. And now what we want actually to do is we want actually to look at, uh, let's say, some of the common methods uh, that we want actually to, uh, let's say, implement in this case uh, one by one. Okay, now uh, let's start actually with a simple one. Uh, what I want actually to do is I want to check whether an element, let's deal, uh, deal with integers, whether an element uh, exists in an array, yes or no. And what we want actually to do is we want actually to implement something we call a linear search. Okay, that's public static uh, boolean. Okay, now uh, the uh, method is called search. It takes uh, two parameters. The first one is the element that I'm searching for. I will call it key. Okay, and the second one is is an array of uh, is an array of integers in this case. Okay, what I will do is is linear search, and what I can do is I can start actually by searching uh, forwards or uh, searching backwards. So let's start actually to implement uh, uh, a method that will perform the search uh, backwards. Thus, I will start from position zero. Okay. Uh, worst case scenario, I have to traverse actually the whole array if I don't find it in any cell. However, I will stop whenever I reach a dot length. If I haven't reached it, I have always actually to go to the next cell in this case. And now the question is, when will I know that I have already actually found the key? Okay, for sure, if my key is equal equal to a of i, then what I need to do is I need to stop and what I have to do is I have to return true in this case. If this is not the case, if I don't return true, meaning I have already passed through all indices from 0 till a dot length minus 1 and I haven't found it and that's why what I have to do is I have to return false in this case, similar, a little bit similar to the method that we implemented actually for strings. Now, once I will go here, okay, I will just create an array. An array is of size, let's say, uh, 4. And what I want to do is, I want to check system.out.println. 
I want actually to check whether uh, let's say the element 7 is in the array axis or not. Okay, now uh, let me compile. Once I will compile, uh, Java will tell me, okay, it looks good. The method is a nice one. I see actually a return true and a return false depending on the cases, whether actually I have found it or not. Okay, and here uh, uh, the 7 occurs in the array X, and that's why I'm expecting true as a result. And what you get here is you get true. Okay, now the question is what would have happened if instead of 7 I would be entering 71? What will happen is I will compare 6 with 71, 6 with 7, 6 with 1, I'm um, sorry, 71 with 1, 71 with 2. And in this case, the 71 doesn't occur in the list and that's why what I will do is I will just actually return in this case false okay why because the element doesn't occur in the list at all thus if you take a look at the time complexity of this algorithm is of n where n is the size of the array and the worst case scenario is the element does not exist in the array at all okay meant uh, uh, a method okay uh, that behaves actually the same as the one before. Uh, however, now what I want to do is I want to search whether a string k occurs in an array of uh, strings. Okay, now uh, let's go and see whether uh, I have actually to change the body of the method. Okay, I don't do it. Okay, and this one actually will work perfectly because here what I will be doing here uh, is is just traversing the array forwards from position zero till I reach a dot length. Whenever I reach a dot length, I will stop, and every time I will check whether the key is equal to uh, the uh, content of uh, cell i. If it is the case, then I will return true. But if I don't return true and I reach actually the length of the array, then I return actually false in this case. Okay, now uh, let's go and uh, try actually to call it. Okay, thus I will be having a string. And now please, you have actually to take care. It depends, okay, uh, how you will be entering, let's say, the strings in your array. Now I will do it actually the way we are used to do it. I will have the GUC, I will have the AUC, I will have the MIU. Okay, now three strings. And last but not least, I will be having actually GUC in this case. Okay, now, uh, once I will compile, uh, I will be expecting here uh, uh, true because the GUC occurs there. And what I will get here is uh, I will get true. Okay, now, please uh, remember what we did in the beginning. In the beginning, uh, we uh, uh, said explicitly if you are having strings, uh, do not actually compare them with equal equal because in this case, what you will be doing here is you will be comparing uh, uh, references. That's actually some people will think, oh, there is a problem. It uh, it worked here. That means actually the equal equal works actually perfectly in this case. Now I will tell you the following. Uh, you have to take care uh, how you uh, uh, define uh, the uh, uh, strings in this case. You have actually two different ways. Either you do it without actually using the new keyword, then Java will intern them automatically and will consider them as primitive data types. That means once you compare, it will compare actually the content. And look, if I will do the following new string, okay, GUC, and here new string, and then AUC, and last but not least, I will be going actually for the search and I will check a new string GUC in this case. Okay, um, I did it actually on purpose. Uh, two of the strings are uh, uh, declared, are created with a new uh, string uh, constructor. It's a new object that I'm creating and the MIU, I didn't actually do it in this case. Now, uh, once you will compile and you will run, uh, what you will be getting here is you will be getting actually false because the equal equal uh, won't actually compare the uh, strings, the content of the strings actually themselves. And that's why what you have actually to do is, instead of writing if k equal equal to a of i, you have to use the equals keyword, the equals method. Okay, thus the question is, if I will do it, then the problem actually will be solved. And what you will be getting here is, 
you will be getting true as a result. Okay, and now even if you will do it with an MIU, okay, without using the new string keyword, this one will work perfectly in this case. Okay, thus I'm expecting true as a result. Okay, and what you will be getting true. Keeping in mind, if I would have, let's say, changed this one back to, um, let's say here, I will comment it in order actually to keep it. Uh, let's say for uh, uh, you uh, to check at home once I post it on the MET website. If I will do it with k equal to a of i, then in this case for the MIU, uh, I will be getting actually the same result, which is uh, true. Why? Because I'm not using actually the new uh, uh, keyword, and that's why uh, in Java it will be interned. Uh, automatically and I will be working in this case with the content with the content of the string which is the MIU and the MIU uh, uh, both uh, let's say uh, strings are equal in this case now just to avoid actually this problem okay the message is please do not use the equal equal to compare objects just to be on the safe side use actually the equals uh, uh, keyword and this one will give you uh, let's say uh, the same uh, uh, result independent whether you are uh, creating uh, objects of type string using the new keyword or without actually doing that okay nice um let's move on i want to implement another method Okay, the other method is also a Boolean one, and it checks whether an array is sorted or not, and it's an array of integers in this case. Okay, now what will I do? Okay, what I have to do is I have to compare, let's say, elements, okay, two consecutive elements with each other. And I know exactly if the first element is not uh, smaller than the second one, then I'm having a problem and I have to stop. Okay, otherwise, I have actually to proceed and compare, let's say, two adjacent elements in this case. Okay, thus I will be having a for loop. For loop starts from i equal to zero till i less than a dot length and now minus one, because if I am reaching the last but one element, I will compare it with the last element, and that's why I don't, I shouldn't actually go and uh, compare let's say the one in position a dot length minus one with the element a dot uh, in position a dot length because actually this element does not exist. Now, in this case, uh, uh, I will uh, check the following. I know exactly I will stop whenever my a of i in this case is greater than a of i plus one. Okay, if this is the case, then I will return false. Okay, and if I don't return false, I compared, let's say, all adjacent elements with each other, and I made sure that actually these elements are ordered relative to each other, and that's why in this case, I will be returning true. Okay, nice. Let's add actually some of the semicolons. Let's go further. Okay, I will comment this one in order that you will have it later as i said before on the juc website i will be having an ala is having four five six seven and 22 okay and the question is i want to check whether this array is sorted or not okay thus uh, is sorted and then a now once i will compile i should if it will compile correctly and i run it i should expect actually true because i will be comparing four with five five with six six with seven and seven with 22 and the elements are uh no i was having now a problem here okay i will compile this one actually will compile correctly okay again four five six seven twenty two uh, once you will compile and uh, you run, uh, you should expect as a result uh, true, and you get actually true as a result. Now, if I would have had actually this one with 70, okay, and you will go and uh, uh, check it whenever I reach 70, 70 is not less than 22, then in this case what I will be returning is uh, false. Please 
uh, take care but I said it already if you just actually do it till a dot length okay uh, you will be having a problem whenever my array is a sorted one you will go okay and what will happen here is the last check will be to check 22 with an element which is out of bound okay in position uh, uh, 5 which doesn't exist and that's why you will be getting an array index or out of bound exception that will be thrown uh, by uh, Java okay thus to be on the safe side what you need actually to do is you need actually to stop whenever you reach a dot length minus one okay mm, because I have already compared now all elements with each other uh, we would love to uh, tackle the following problem we want to check whether a specific character for example C okay or U occurs in an array of strings assume I'm having GUC I'm having the AUC and last but not least I'm having the GIUAS okay thus the method that I should implement should return for me true okay however if I take let's say the following example and I will check whether C occurs in GUC AUC and GIUAS then I should get actually false in this case why because this C occurs in the GUC it occurs in the AUC but it doesn't occur in the GIUAS in this case okay now to solve this problem we will think about decomposing the problem into sub problems we solve the sub problems and after that we conquer thus the first thing what I need to implement is is a method, a simple method that checks whether a character occurs in a string yes or no. Okay, thus the method will be a Boolean method. It called search. It takes two parameters. The first one is is a character C, and the second one is is a string S. Now what I will do is I will have a for loop. For loop will start from i equal to zero till i is smaller than s dot length, where here. I will be using the method length that will be invoked on a string and i plus plus and the question is when should i stop whenever i find it thus if my c is equal equal to one of the characters of the string s dot char at of i in this case i will know exactly that i have to return true now if i have done it okay for every character and i haven't found it at the end of the day I will return false and this one we have already implemented it actually before now let's go to the main method and let's run it system.out.println what will I print I will print the search of for example C okay and a string which is the GUC in this case what I need actually to get is I need to get true I will compile hopefully this one will compile correctly and last but not least once I will run I should expect true as a result and what I will be getting here is I will be getting true if I would have done it with a I should expect false as a result and my method will return false as a result why because I will be comparing it a with the G a with the U a with the C it doesn't actually work and that's why at the end of the day I will return false in this case okay thus it's nice I have now one method that checks whether a character occurs in a string yes or no now the method that I want to implement is a method okay I will just overload I will call it search or search all okay this one will have as a parameter a character C however the second parameter is not one string but it's an array of strings in this case okay now if you think about it here you need actually nested loops but since we implemented one already one method that uses actually a for loop you won't see the nested loop explicitly but you will see it actually implicitly in this case now what do I have to do I have to go and check let's say the strings one by one which is in the array of strings for int i equal to zero i strictly less dot s dot length and here you have to take care this length corresponds to the length of the array it's the array of strings okay and what I have to do is I have to go and check 
let's say inside the method whether the character C occurs in every string in the array of strings. If it doesn't occur in one, then in this case what I have to do is I have to return false. Thus what I will do is I will actually check if my character doesn't occur in S of I, then I know exactly what I have to return is I have to return false. However, if I don't return false, then the search will be always actually successful. And that's why what I need to do is I will need to return true in this case. Okay, nice. Now, once I will compile, most probably Java will tell me, yes, your program actually looks nice. There are actually two return statements. Here you will see that I am having a kind of a hidden for loop implemented in uh, in this outer loop. That means actually I'm having nested loops, but you don't see them explicitly. Why? Because I decompose my problem into sub problems. Now the question is, uh, how will it work? Okay, I will just create an array of strings. Okay, I will have, let's say, <coughs> GUC, then AUC, uh, the example that we have above, GIUAS, Okay, and last but not least, I will write system.out.println and I will uh, search the u, which is my character u, in this uh, array of string s. Okay, the u occurs in the GUC, the u occurs in the AUC, and the u occurs at the GIUAS. That means once I will compile, if this one will compile correctly, Search, uh, search all. If this one will compile correctly, because I uh, called actually the method search all, if this one co will compile correctly, okay, and I will run, I'm expecting true as a result, and what you get as a result is true. Why? Because the U occurs at the GUC, the U occurs in the AUC string, and the U occurs in the GIOAS string. Now, if I will replace this one by C, what I should get here is I should get, uh, get false. Why? Because this C occurs in the GUC string. It occurs in the AUC string, but it doesn't occur in the GIUAS string. And that's why here you are getting false as a result. Last uh, example for today is uh, the uh, reverse of an array. Okay. Thus, uh, if I want actually to reverse an array, well, array is of the form 1, 2, 3, 4. What I want to do is, as a result, I want actually to get 4, 3, 2, 1 as a result. Okay, uh, we will implement uh, two different uh, methods. One method will use an additional array where the result will be stored. And the second method will be a method that will be working in place, meaning uh, I will take the array, which is the input uh, array, and the uh, array itself uh, has uh, to change after calling the method to be in this case 4321. Okay, now uh, let me start uh, with uh, the idea how the algorithm works. Thus, I'm having uh, uh, four elements. Okay, what I need to do is I need to create an array uh, of the same size as the input uh, uh, one. If this is my x, then my result should have something of the following form, okay? Uh, a kind of an array of size uh, 4. However, since in the beginning I haven't done anything, okay, at the end of the day, the result uh, should be in the beginning four zeros since the length of the input uh, uh, result uh, is uh, 4. And then what I need to do is I need to uh, change the values of the r depending on the values of the x and that's why i know exactly that this first argument okay the first uh, cell which is r of zero uh, should be in this case equal to x of three okay now uh, once i do that i have to go to the second cell and r of two has to be in this case equal to x of two Okay, R of 1, R of 1, which is actually the 
uh, first uh, second element of the list has to be equal to uh, let's say the last but one element in this case that means I will be having something of the form okay x uh, of 2 and last but not least if I do it with r of 2 then I will be uh, uh, having uh, 0 now and I have to change it to be equal to 2 and 2 corresponds to x of 1 and last but not least I will be having r of 3 which is the last element of the result okay is equal to 0 now and I have actually to override it to be equal to x of 0 in this case okay yes uh, this method actually can be implemented easily thus I will be implementing a static method that will return an array of integers as a result after performing the reverse of an array an array of integers too. now uh, let me do actually the first step I want actually to create an array the array has to be of the of the same size as the input array X and that's why I will be creating an array now you see me writing the square brackets after the X okay I have the choice either to write it before or after okay that's this one will work too and now what I want actually to do is I want to create an array I will call it R okay the R will have the same size as the A in this case okay uh, first thing will be done if I will do that okay at the end of the day I have to return it now if I run actually this algorithm but then what you will be getting here is you will be getting only zeros I will uh, show you uh, let's say uh, the result if I will do it now with uh, the following input okay it's having one two three four okay and last but not least what I want to do is I want actually to display the reverse of X in this case okay now uh, let me compile okay the code hopefully will compile uh, correctly and now once I will run uh, you will be getting uh, four zeros since I didn't actually populate uh, the result uh, uh, array yet okay now the question is uh, how will I do it now I will do actually these four steps with a counter loop because I will be going from position 0 to position 1 to position 2 to position 3 okay and you see here that in this case I will need a counter loop that starts with position 0 I uh, strictly less than a dot length which is equal to result dot length i plus plus and now what I want to do is I want actually to have an r of i equal to in this case this one corresponds to the length of the list minus 1 this one corresponds to the length of the list minus one minus one now once I go to the third iteration this one corresponds to the length of the list minus one minus two and last but not least this one corresponds to the length of the list minus one minus three and that's why without using an additional variable I can write actually the following that this one r of i is equal to a of a dot length minus 1 minus i in this case now once I will compile you see exactly that the elements of the R will be populated accordingly using let's say the following pattern where the first element is let me go down the first element which is an R of 0 will become 4 and the last element which is in this case r of uh, uh, 3 will be equal to 4 in this case thus the reverse will work nicely okay uh, however here the main problem is if I uh, uh, implement this one the time complexity of it is uh, O of n where n is the length of the input list okay however I'm using additional memory in this case because every time if I am having an array of size 1 million then I have actually always to create uh, a new uh, array and the new array uh, which is the result will be also of size 1 million in this case the question is uh, can I do it in place okay now uh, the main idea of in place is if I have as an input X which is equal to 1 uh, 2 
three, four, five. Then in this case, after uh, the reverse, okay, the x uh, should become now equal to five, four, three, two, and one in this case. Okay, now the question is, uh, uh, how can I do it? Uh, it's uh, easy. Okay, if I have one, two, three, four, five, this is actually my input uh, result. What I need to do is, I need actually, in place means I will not use an additional uh, memory for uh, the result array. That's, I will take the one and I will take the five and I will swap them. That's the result will be in this case equal to five, two, three, four, and one. I'm swapping the five with the one. I'm swapping the first element with the last element. Then I will go further and I will take the two and I will take the four and I will swap them. Thus, I will be getting four, five, then four, three will remain actually as is, then actually two and one. Now, I can do an additional actually task, okay, an additional step where this one will be replaced by itself. However, in this case, if I have the five, the four, the three will be replaced by three and the result actually will be equal actually to two, one in this case, okay. Now, uh, how, how, how can I do that? It's, it's easy, okay, uh, we will do it, let's say, with a, a temporary variable actually to swap. That's the temporary variable is equal to a of zero at the beginning. Okay, and uh, then I will take a of zero, and what I will do is I will replace it by a, okay, of a dot uh, length minus one. In this case, it's uh, three. I will take an a of zero, okay, and then, I will put in it, in this case, the five, and the five corresponds to a of four. Okay, I'm having four elements, that means in this case, uh, five elements, that means uh, the last element will be in position four. And last but not least, the a of four will be equal to the TMP in this case. Okay, now, this is the first iteration. Now, uh, the second iteration. Okay, once I will do that, then the result will become five, two, three, four, one. This is actually, let's say, the result in the first iteration. Now, I want actually to go further, then what I will do is, I will take as a temporary variable, now, an a of one, okay? And what I will do is, an a of one, I will just change it, which is uh, this two. I have to change it, in this case, with four. That means I will swap the two elements the two will become four and the four will become two. That means the a of one will be equal to a of three in this case. And last but not least, I know exactly what the a of three will be. Okay, the a of three will be equal to the temp in this case. And last but not least, I will go to, uh, let's say, uh, this is the status after the second iteration, I will go let's say to the last one okay the last one in de depending on how you will implement it okay can be implemented as follows that the tmp is equal to a of two okay and the a of two will be replaced by in this case a of two that is nothing will change and last but not least the a of two will get as an element tmp thus in this case i will be taking the three and i will be swapping the three with itself okay thus this are let's say the three steps that could be performed in order to perform the reverse in place now uh, how will i implement it okay i will implement now a void method because I will not return any array. I don't need to do it since actually the array that I will be getting as input is the one that I will be changing. I will call it reverse two. It's an array of, let's say, a specific size. And that's why what I will do is, I will go start from i equal to zero. And I have always to stop whenever I reach the middle of the array. Yes. If my i is strictly less than a dot length, then I should actually proceed. Okay. Last but not least, I will uh, have to perform the swap of two elements in this case. Okay. I will have int tmp is equal to a of i. Okay. My first step. a of 0, a of 1, a of 2. And last but not least, I will take a of i. 
and I will replace it here by a of 4, then a of 3, and then a of 2, which corresponds to a of a dot length minus 1 minus i in this case. And last but not least, I will take an a of a dot length minus 1 minus i, and I will replace this one by t and p. Okay, and life will be good. Now this is my reverse, and I hope that the reverse 2 will work which in this case, the time complexity will be the same because I'm performing n over 2 operations, okay, n over 2 swaps, thus the time complexity is a linear time complexity is O of n, okay, and now the question is, uh, let me see whether this one will work or not. Okay, that's what I will do is, I will just display the x before the reverse, before calling the reverse 2. Okay, then I will write system.out.println, Okay, and then after the reverse, I want to see the result of the x. Thus, I will write reverse 2 of x. Okay, and last but not least, I will display the x again. Okay, thus, once I will compile, this one will compile correctly. Now, once I will run, what I will be getting here is, I should get 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, and then after the swap, I should get actually uh, um, uh, one, uh, uh, four, three, two, one. Thus, uh, this one uh, didn't work. And now the question is, what's uh, the problem? Why isn't it uh, working? Again, we want to uh, check where the problem is. Uh, because, again, once I will uh, compile, uh, we should expect as a result the reverse of the list. However, here with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, okay, I'm getting an echo, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay, now, uh, going back to the method, uh, you take a look at the body of the method. The body of the method is uh, 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 working properly. Thus, I'm having, uh, let's say, some of the statements to swap the first element with the last element and the second element with the last but one element, the third element by, by the last but two elements, and so on. Okay, now the main problem is, uh, if we go back to the condition, we see that uh, I will be stopping whenever my i reaches the a dot length uh, uh, in this case. Meaning, uh, what happens here is, since I didn't stop by half of the array, I will uh, go back and take all elements that I swapped actually before and I swap them back to their original position. And that's why I'm getting an echo. Thus, my main problem is that the condition is wrong. What I need to do is, here you see it, I have to stop not actually by a dot length minus one, but I have to stop whenever I reach a dot length. Now, the nice thing is, uh, once I will compile and run, uh, now just actually by changing it a dot length by a dot length divided by 2, uh, the algorithm works properly. I will be getting an array of uh, size 5. This is my uh, x. Okay. Uh, once I display it, I will be getting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And after the swap, I will be getting 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. It worked properly. Now, the total number of elements here is 5. Thus, the length is odd. Okay, the question is, what if the length of the array is even? Meaning the total number of elements will correspond to a number, and this number is an even one. Okay, now, uh, I will run it. I will uh, compile and uh, run and see whether the algorithm works. And you see that the algorithm works properly. Thus, after the swap, the first element will become 6, the second element will become 5, and the last uh, element will become 1. That means the algorithm works properly for even length of arrays as well as for odd length of arrays in this case. Okay, uh, we reached to the end uh, today. Mm, hope you enjoyed the lecture. I hope I will see you on campus uh, soon. Okay, if not, uh, I want just actually to tell you to keep calm, to uh, stay safe, uh, one day uh, things actually will uh, get uh, better. You will be coming back just to, to be able actually to get uh, the face-to-face -face, uh, uh, education that we are used uh, to have it. Uh, for now, I want only to encourage you just to uh, do a lot of uh, programming uh, these days at home. Uh, 
uh, you will have a lot of practice assignments posted on our portal uh, we will post soon uh, the final exams that you have the previous final exams you have to take a look at them and last but not least if you want to have more challenging uh, problems I would only encourage you again to go to Geeks for Geeks just to take a look at uh, some of the advanced topics covered uh, there uh, you can just uh, try to solve them and uh, stay safe stay home and see you soon assalamu alaikum bye bye take care